So welcome everyone to the November edition of the Open Lineage monthly meeting. Um, you'll find, so this meeting is recording and you'll find their recording and archive on uh, Wiki and uh, YouTube. And uh, as usual, we start the meeting with doing a roll call. So I call people out in the order they show on my screen. And uh, just give a, a quick introduction um, of uh, yourself and what you want out of this meeting, if, if there's a topic you want to be discussed, or if uh, you just want to be here and listen in, it's also fine. So there's no pressure um, to necessarily have something uh, to contribute to the meeting, and it's fine to just be listening in. And on that, I'll start with uh, Pavel on my screen. Hello, I'm Pavel. I'm software engineer at Getting Data, and I'm Open Linux contributor. And I'm super happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Next is myself. I'm Julian. I'm chief architect, astronomer, and lead for the Open Lineage project. And uh, today I have a couple of. Um, things to talk about, um, but other are here to facilitate. Uh, next on my screen is Michael Robinson. Uh, I have to unmute myself. Hi, uh, I'm on the community team at Astronomer and I coordinate these meetings. Happy to be here. Sam. Um, me, okay. Uh, I'm Sam, I am a software engineer at Astronomer working on observability, um, just listening in today. Rachi. Hi, I'm a software engineer in observability and uh, yeah, just partaking in the meeting today. Mache. Hello, I'm a software engineer at Getting Data and Open Image Committer. And today I'm here just to listen. Next is uh, Petra. Hi, my name is, my name is Petra Hayek. I'm a consultant working for Manta. And at Manta, we are uh, building a connector for open lineage. Uh, I can give some very brief updates maybe later on uh, uh, what we have done so far. Basically, we are able to connect Manta, which is open lineage <coughs> analytical tool with any uh, open lineage producer and visualize you know, the lineage in, in the software. Great. Yes, we will make sure to save some time to talk about this. Um, next is Haril. Hi, everyone. I'm an engineering manager and astronomer uh, working on data observability. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the updates today. Great to be here. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Minkyu, and I'm a software engineer at Astronomer, a part of the Absolute Loop team, and also a contributor to Open Lineage and Marcus, and happy to be here. Michael Collado. Hey there, uh, Mike Collado. I'm a staff software engineer at Astronomer, I'm also a contributor to Open Lineage and to Marcus. Uh, Willie. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Willie. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Astronomer working on data observability. I'm the co-creator of Marquez and a committer to Open Lineage. And I'm excited to hear about Manta's uh, adoption of Open Lineage. Um, yeah. Shiri? Hello, I'm Shiri Cabral. I'm a product manager for technical lineage and ETL tools at Calibra. Um, and I am working on kicking the tires from a product perspective of this, the open lineage um, standard and spec. So I have a long kind of open, open source community history, and I'm continuing that in my current role. Great. Uh, Ross? Hey, I'm Ross. Uh, I'm on the community team here at Astronomer, and I'm, uh, I'm here to help, as always. Um, Martin, um, Martin. 
Hi, my name is Martin Fulton. I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm a project manager in the Data Foundation for AI team. We have several researchers uh, attending the meeting today. I think we are on schedule to present on the common metadata framework and the opportunities to connect this framework with uh, Open Lineage. Great. Uh, Nigel? Hi, I'm Nigel Jones. I'm a maintainer on the Ageria project. I work for IBM. I'm interested to catch up with where Open Lineage is at and also to uh, hear the presentations today. I work along with Mandy. Welcome. Um, Ad Mary. Hi, um, I'm Ann Mary. I work with Hewlett Picard as a research engineer. I'm part of the Common Metadata Framework team. Uh, we work on uh, tracking metadata for AI pipelines. So yeah, later today, we'll give a brief, brief overview about CMF and how we can connect with Open Lineage. Great. Uh, Alap? Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. I'm Alap Tripathi. I'm a research engineer working uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise together with Anne and Martin, who have already introduced. Uh, I'm part of the Common Metadata Framework team, and we're basically helping to collect uh, workflow metadata, and we're here to figure out uh, how we can collaborate with the Open Lineage uh, team here, like-minded. Uh, Glenn? Uh, hi there. Yeah, so Glenn Bowden. I'm also with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, I'm the chief architect for our AI and data practice in our services group, um, but also leading an engineering team that are doing some work implementing CMF, um, including all the open lineage aspects, as well as some other standards as well. Sergey. Hello, I'm uh, Sergey, a researcher at uh, Hewlett Packard Labs, and I'm here to talk about uh, pipeline level management for machine learning and workloads. Suparna. Suparna, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, so many of us from uh, Hewlett Packard Labs uh, and, and uh, of today. So um, we're also here to uh, present the common metadata framework. Uh, so I work in uh, in in the area of uh, data centric um, AI and uh, have a background in storage and also a lot of open source background in the Linux kernel community. So we are uh, really excited to see how to connect uh, our CMF project, which is an open source project with Open Lineage and uh, work more closely with this community. Great, looking forward. So next is Nigel. Um, so this is Nigel Jones. I gave an introduction just a few minutes ago. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. So what, what's... What's happening is when people turn off their video, they move to the back of the queue, and then I sorry, I got confused. Sorry. Well, that, I'm here Michael. twice. I'll listen extra hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, next, um, so let me see who I forgot. Omri. Uh, I had already introduced myself. Uh, oh, so sorry about that. Uh, so, um, who's, so who did I forget? I think Howard. Hey, everybody. How are you? Um, Prong manager in Astronomer, um, uh, actively engaged in Open Lineage, uh, Marcas, Data Observability. So good to be here. Thank you. John? That's me. I'm John Thomas. I work on the community team at, Ast uh, at Astronomer, working with primarily Airflow, but always happy to help out however I can. Mandy? Hi, everybody. I'm Mandy Chessel. I lead the Ageria team, and Ageria is both a consumer and a producer of Open Lineage events. And last but not the least, uh, Benji. Hey everyone, I'm an ecosystem. Uh, I'm on the ecosystem team at Astronomer. Um, I do a lot of integration work with Open Lineage and Airflow and Great Expectations, and a little bit of DBT now too. Awesome. 
so this is, uh, sorry, they took a little longer than usual because there's a lot of people today, which is great. Um, so next is just a quick reminder of where you can find, where you, we can communicate the most. Slack is the best place uh, to reach out if you have questions and so on. There's some announcement going on the mailing list. The notes go on the wiki. Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn are usually updates on a new release coming up uh, or a blog post about Open Lineage and the YouTube channel as a recording of this meeting. And so today uh, <clears throat> we'll start with a couple of um, announcements. Uh, so I'll cover that. And then Michael is going to talk about the recent release uh, 16.1 uh, and give the a progress update on um, getting to the next level, not graduating, but uh, to the next level uh, <clears throat> of uh, maturation in the LFI and data life cycle. Um, and then uh, there are a couple of other items I talked about the open image implementation. Uh, we have the Menta update um, and talking about CMF and open discussion. So I think we'll, uh, Michael, we'll try to go quick on our part so we have more time to talk about the two uh, Menta and CMF items. So on the announcements, um, uh, so um, we are happy to announce that Open Lineage has earned the uh, core infrastructure silver badge, which was one of the requirements to get from sandbox to incubation and the LFI in data. So now all we have to do is get uh, approved to get to the next level by the TAC um, and the LFI. And so happening soon, uh, we'll apply formally. Um, we have a great blog post by Ernie talking in the Manta Open Lineage integration that you can find on the Open Lineage website. Uh, there's a new ecosystem page on the Open Lineage website, which is um, here. So if you go on the website, you have an ecosystem page that talks about um, the consumers and the producers. And you see there's a few uh, logos missing here and that we're in the process of asking uh, permission uh, because there are a few consumers uh, that should be here. Like obviously uh, Microsoft Purview is one. Um, so you can find Ageria here uh, and, um, and also some of the integrations uh, that are here. And I realize Manta should probably be on the second list instead of the first list, I think, or oh, maybe both. Anyway, we can- And Nigeria should probably be in the producer page as well. Yes, and Nigeria should be on, on both lists. That's correct, mm -hmm. that's correct. So, you know, if you want to do this, um, feel free to uh, open a pull request or, or ping us on the open in uh, Slack uh, to update this. But this is, the goal of this is to really um, enable people to find all the ways you can consume and produce open lineage and um, spotlight the ecosystem and the various um, things that exist. <clears throat> um, so we also uh, have a workshop uh, repo now that um, help quickly try out uh, open lineage with things like Spark. So to do a quick uh, run of uh, Spark jobs and see the result in Marquez and find the lineage and so do quick uh, workshop to practically use open lineage. You can find that on the GitHub. Um, there's been a lot of improvements in the Airflow documentation and guidance on creating a custom extractor to support external operators. And in the Spark docs, improved documentation uh, for the column lineage facet and extension. So in the Spark integration, there's support for column lineage extraction. And uh, so there's more docs that have been uh, created to explain that. And thanks a lot to the contributors. And sorry, I'm going a bit fast to save time for the other topics. So on that, uh, Michael, I'll let you talk about the uh, recent release 16.1. Yes, uh, thanks, and I'll be quick also just giving the highlights here. In 16.1, which we released on the 3rd, uh, most of the changes were to the Airflow integration. 
Um, with 1133, we added the DAG run ID, uh, making that additional information available. Uh, with 1149, added a new class, the logging mix-in class, to make the output consistent with general airflow and open lineage logging. Uh, with 1162, added a new default extractor to support the default implementation of open lineage for external operators without the need for custom extractors. With 1188, added the on-complete argument in the default extractor to add support for running another method um, on extract on complete. And then a big uh, contribution to the SQL integration, re reorganizing that library into multiple packages. So we have a Rust implementation of that library and foreign language bindings, which eases the process of adding language interfaces in the future and a CI fix there as well. Um, changes were also to the Airflow integration here. Um, we moved the get connection URI as the extractors class method in 1169, which was allowing for too many params resulting in really long URIs. And uh, also in Airflow, change the get open lineage facets on start complete behavior, splitting up the method for greater legibility and easier maintenance. An important removal to mention, uh, the long promised removal of Airflow 1.10 happened with this release. Uh, thank you, Mache, for that. Thank you, Kuba. Uh, thank you to our new contributor, Piotr. Um, uh, BingQ, anyone else I'm forgetting, I apologize. There are some fixes from Benji and Pavel as well. For more information, as always, look at the change log. And that's it. Uh, next, Michael, is your date on the LFI and the uh, <clears throat> process race update. Right. So uh, just uh, quickly here, so a little bit of background. We're in the process of uh, moving through the LFAI and data uh, process. And this is just a just a snapshot of the corporate structure over there. We're one of the hosted projects. And in order to move up, we need approval by the Technical Advisory Council and the governing board. Um, the next slide shows, uh, you know, the many projects that um, are also in the LFAI and data um, organization here, um, which is a subset of the LF, the larger LF foundation. Um, just to give you the big picture. But where we are in the process is we're expecting very soon to move, uh, move up to incubation status. We started out in sandbox status in May of 2021. And as you can see on the next slides, um, we also expect to graduate soon. So you need two organizations to actively contribute to your project. We have 23. You need 300 stars for incubation. We've, we've recently crested 1,000. We have the silver badge now. Uh, we have a TSC with the chair. That's Julian, of course. So all we need to do now is formalize our sponsorship to get incubation and uh, do the formal presentation. And then just, yeah, one last thing about graduation. You can see from this slide that we're very close as well to earning all of those requirements for graduation. Um, so we're looking forward to having more news about our progress in the LFAI and, that, uh, and data very soon. Are they, they going to force you to do them separately, or do you think they'll let you do both at once to jump um, to levels? Because you're yeah. so close. It's just... Exactly. I'm, I'm curious to hear from Ibrahim. I reached out to him just yesterday about how he wants to handle that. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think you're, as I say, you're you're doing so well, and if you can get your go your gold badge, then um, uh, yeah, I mean, say it's 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 just looking so impressive. It would be nice if you could get you get to graduation in in uh, in one hop. Yeah, right alongside our sister project Marquez, as it happens, that would be great. Indeed. So nice. um, about the funding, like I, in the last slide, I actually saw something about getting uh, getting a sponsorship. Um, what is it? What is that about, and what is required for us to get the sponsorship? Just have curious to know. Slide um, number fourteen. That's that's something that I just asked Ibrahim yesterday because what we okay. need to do is give him, you know, the 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 or, the 
um, project that we want to sponsor us. And so I'm learning about that as we, yeah, as we speak. Okay. I don't okay. think it's sponsor in a financial sense. I think it's sponsor in more like a chaperone or coach sense. Uh, I, I don't think this is a financial thing, but uh, I, I okay. think wrong. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So on the next item, uh, but actually I was planning. So yeah, proposal define open lineage implementation. I think right now, there are a couple of projects who have implementing implemented uh, consuming open lineage events. And at the moment, um, it's a bit underdocumented on the website of what are the different ways uh, to do an open lineage implementation. So obviously there's Marquez, there's Algeria, there's the Azure purview uh, implementation. And the goal of this would be to have a better uh, specified documentation on what that means to implementing op implement open lineage. Uh, and there's a couple of reference architectures that people can use, right? Some people like to consume um, HTTP events uh, directly. Some other people like to have a Kafka queue in between. And so um, it's just a heads up that um, contribution is welcome. And uh, that's something that we'd like to clarify to enable uh, easier community growth around consuming and also producing open lineage and adding, adding more integration. So on that, I don't want to spend too much time on that. If people have questions and uh, or we can also develop at the next meeting uh, once we probably would have made more progress on this. And on that, unless someone has a question, I'll give the microphone to uh, uh, Peter. Okay, sure. Let me uh, share my screen now. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll stop sharing so you can. So this will be a very quick update <clears throat> on how we are progressing with Manta Open Lineage Connector. I hope you can see my screen now. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, uh, so you know, from a technical point of view, it's quite straightforward. Uh, you know, solution. Uh, we use so-called Manta agent, which is installed at the customer's side, and uh, we use it to set up an API endpoint for Manta, and we use this endpoint to somehow, you know. Uh, catch or capture uh, the open lineage or runtime events to be to be exact, and we keep sending you know information in open lineage model format um, uh, to Manta open lineage extractor, and we do some other transformations that we store it in some in temporary repository. Um, we uh, you know read um, the information contained in J in JSON files. We uh, reconstruct the open lineage graph and then we move it uh, to the Manta uh, repository, which is a common Manta model. And then uh, finally, we are able to draw the Manta graph. So technically, this this is pretty much straightforward. There is nothing special uh, in this in this solution, and we should be able to generally, uh, you know make any open lineage uh, producer compatible with Manta uh, using this simple uh, schema or scenario. Uh, I will show you how it uh, looks uh, when we uh, read something uh, uh, from open lineage uh, producer. This is an example of Kabula. Uh, Kabula uh, you know, gave us access to their training environment. Uh, and we are testing the connector on their so-called um, you know, metadata repository, or they call it telemetry data. So uh, we are capturing, you know, the events on their side, then sending to uh, to Manta connector, and we are reconstructing the, the lineage. So in this example, I will, for example, uh, focus on a specific uh, data set, KBC project. I've selected this one here among the focus elements. And I'll start visualization. Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just 
a moment, please. Yeah. And now I can drill down to details. Uh, for some entities, I can see even the list of, uh, of columns, but this is not yet the true column level lineage because for run and run events, we keep the information still on the table level. So we have this like dummy column here um, instead of the real uh, real real columns. But you can see that we can we can visualize you know all the dependencies here as we do in Manta for any other data processing um, technology. And we can drill down and see more more details if there are some of them and so on. So that's that's uh, that's basically it. We are now um, searching for kind of let's say volunteers uh, for further testing of this um, of this connector because we are aware of the fact that you know there will be definitely much higher richness of um, you know, of those environments behind open lineage producers, and there are also several options how to visualize uh, these dependency trees uh, in Manta. This option, this version that we are now uh, looking at um, works primarily with data sets and runs. Uh, we have also uh, an option where we primarily focus on data sets and jobs, and then we can drill down to runs and run events. And there are some, some other you know, options in visualization and interpretation of, of metadata. The good thing is that once we have this open lineage metadata in Manta repository, we can combine it with uh, data lineage information, which we obtain from other technologies like on-premise Oracle, SQL Server, and you know lots of there are really tens tens of technologies that we can uh, we can um, capture in Manta, and we can combine it. So we can draw the lineage across multiple technologies, including those that are accessible through through open lineage. So we now are really seeking for volunteers to participate in testing and fine tuning of this connector and the visualization of open lineage, you know, uh, inside of uh, Manta. So basically, that's uh, that's it from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, I have a question. Are you yes. using uh, column level lineage facet from open lineage? Uh, not yet. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we we don't have good examples of this metadata. So if 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 you if you have something uh, uh, that you can generate uh, column level facet, we are ready to read it, uh, but we have not tested yet. So in this case, uh, you know those JSON files contained only information about structures of uh, of data sets, and then we visualize I, we visualize all the columns uh, which are there. Uh, and if you have good examples of column level, um, you know JSON files, um, uh, we can very quickly adjust the connector and visualize it, visualize visualize column level. So if you have good examples and you would like to participate in in this process, uh, uh, you would be welcome. So yeah, so the the workshop I was mentioning uh, in the announcement is a good example of that. So if you go in the Open Lineage Workshops uh, repository okay. on GitHub, and there's the Spark folder in it. And actually, let me let me share and sh show this. Okay. okay. Um, um, let me share the right screen. Right. So this one. So I went to the Open Lineage GitHub account to the workshop repository and the Spark folder here. There's an example of uh, using Jupyter Notebook to run a Spark job that will produce uh, column level lineage. And so you can run this. Uh, I think I can click okay. on this. It actually runs and even runs in uh, GitHub. Okay, and, okay you, and you see, you know, you can run a simple uh, Spark mm -hmm. job that creates a data frame, access some uh, column. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when you run it locally, it would actually work. So this is, um, and then 
you can see the column lineage. Uh, it's an in column lineage event. Yes. <clears throat> and yes. then it shows how to get the lineage yes. back from the end. Okay. Course. Okay. Yes. Good. Uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's good. We will definitely uh, try this one. But, you know, what would really be uh, great for us if we have real examples from, uh, like, you know, real, real environments really are like in production or something like that. But you will definitely use this one just for the initial testing, but for the you know, proper thorough testing, you would need really the real life environments. Yeah, currently, um, I don't think we have any like a uh, large scale <laughs> usages of the condom lineage, unfortunately. Yeah. No problem. Just you know, if if you have uh, if you have information about uh, you know somebody who who be ready for this, just just let me know, and we will do this. You know. Uh, of course, for free because this is like you know the contribution to, to the mutual work, and we would really appreciate having this because you know we are we are kind of blind because we are like using this you know dummy testing data, uh, and you know it's it's not the real real life. No. Okay. Any other question about these uh, Manta integration updates? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for thank sharing. You. And uh, I think you can, uh, oh, you probably had ping the Slack channel already. So feel free to ping the Slack channel as well if, if you want more people. And uh, we can also amplify this on the okay. OpenEnish project. Okay. So next is um, the linking CMF. Um, the common uh, ML metadata framework and open image by uh, Suparna and Mary of HP Enterprise. So I'll release the screen and let you uh, present. Thank you, Julie. Let me just share my screen. I, yeah. So it, yeah, let me just get a little bit uh, started on this. So yeah, the at the beginning of the of the first slide, I can you can see the link to our uh, yeah, the CMF project. It's an open source project uh, that several of us uh, have been working on. Uh, it's it's an it's an early uh, effort, and so we would actually love to see uh, contributors or free feedback on this. Um, so this. Uh, to just talk about, you know, uh, we'll try to say this a little bit compactly. There's probably a much more longer discussion to explain what CMF is, but we'll try to give a very quick overview uh, of this and where it fits in the open lineage ecosystem and you know what we're trying to do with it. Uh, so we can go to the agenda slide. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, so first of all, I, I think we've mentioned this in one of the previous calls um, so what we are uh, really trying to do with the uh, CMF or common metadata framework uh, for, for AI, and it can be used a little bit beyond AI. It's, you know, we've used it also in uh, BI for science and scientific workflows. Um, is oftentimes what happens is the metadata and lineage that you track, um, especially when you're working on AI pipelines, you do a lot of experiments, you do a lot of different pieces. Um, and you know, when you're working as a data scientist, you have, you have lots of trials. And even though the, there are lots of uh, tools that exist, uh, oftentimes you see this lineage and metadata is this stranded lineage and metadata, which people are working on in their environments and um, not actually getting to capture that. Um, and as we were trying to build more, um, uh, and, and we'll come to that in a moment as you try to build more trustworthy AI models and you really want to look at the trajectory of what happens from the data to the transformations to the models that are generated and what is you know transfer learned from those models and then you know how that behaves in production and then again how you get feedback from that. Uh, so it needs a linkage between all of these kinds of uh, pieces of metadata. And so we've been trying to build this framework of which, uh, you know, one example of it is, you know, a simple uh, library that we have, which uh, you can use from an MLR data science environment. 
uh, and uh, it could be used in a Jupyter notebook or Python scripts. Uh, we will talk about some of the explicit and implicit APIs as well as we go off. Uh, but it means that you can work anywhere. You work on your laptop, you work in the cloud anywhere, and you record your uh, metadata, your pipeline lineage and, and metrics. Um, and then you can choose to push it uh, at some time just in a Git-like fashion. So the idea is that just as you can work with uh, Git uh, for, with uh, code, um, and then there is data version control, which works, lets you work with uh, Git-like way for working with data. You also want the same thing with metadata so that you can collect uh, metadata and, and share it and have branches of it. But then what we really want to do is to be able to make that metadata consumable, usable in, in, a, you know, in a catalog or any consumer uh, to actually stitch things together. Uh, for example, uh, you know, other sources of lineage that exist. And so to do that, we are uh, really been working on this, uh, started working on having an open metadata or mobile lineage publisher, which will take this lineage from CMF and then allow it to publish it to any open lineage compatible consumer. So I just mentioned a couple of them, but um, uh, any of those could be used. Um, and, and on the side of that, we've also been working with some existing catalogs and also trying to see if we can have an open lineage connector so that we can uh, pull some of this metadata there. Um, so um, let's maybe move to the uh, next, uh, next slide here. Um, and um, so maybe I'll let Anne take over and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what's, what's special or what's different about uh, CMF and, and uh, you know, so, so that will give some context before we talk about how we actually map uh, CMF to open lineage and which is where we would love to have some discussion with the community and, you know, are, are we taking the right approach or, you know, any, any ideas and so forth. Thanks, Supana. So uh, what are the challenges what we are trying to solve here? Because there are other existing metadata tracking tools. So the challenges that we are trying to track, uh, solve here is to get the end-to-end -end visibility of a pipeline. So if you take an AI pipeline, it has multiple stages and each stage could be executed independently in a distributed fashion in a distributed site. So it's not just about the training alone. So it's about the data pre-processing that you have, the inference stage, the monitoring stage. So the multiple stages that a pipeline could have and how the different stages a data could flow through. So we want to track the end-to-end -end visibility for an AI pipeline. And if you take a complex AI pipeline, like in the scientific world, there could be multiple models in the same pipeline and the performance of a model at a particular stage could influence the performance of another model at a subsequent stage. So you should be able to track these dependencies between the different artifacts that are there in the pipeline. And also uh, there could be different experiment variations for a particular model. So each experiment variation will actually start its own lineage chain and you should be able to track end to end all through this different lineage chain that could be there. So it is not a trivial job to track these, depend these different dependencies and the lineage chains that could be there. When you have different multiple experiment variations and when you have multiple models that are there in the pipeline. So that is where CMF comes in. So CMF allows you to track that lineages you would have and manage that lineage for you. And uh, in the era of data centric AI, you it's not just enough to concentrate on the model development and model training alone. You need to have that end-to-end -end visibility of that entire pipeline. You should know how that data has evolved. What are the different processing that has, it has gone through to understand whether there is any bias in the data or there any imbalance in the data. So that end-to-end -end visibility is what CMF would provide. And by doing this, we it will be able to produce reproducible pipelines because we track everything right from the code, the artifact used, and the metadata used for your pipeline and allows it to be auditable and you have end-to-end -end traceability also for your models. And all of this would enable a shorter development time for your model, enables more optimization, like less labeling effort, or enables like hyperparameter seeding. So these are the other optimizations that we can build on top of this metadata that we have collected. As an example, uh, CMF has been used for the Exatrack particle detection pipeline, which is what you're seeing in the slide on the right. 
Uh, this is from the high energy physics uh, domain. Uh, it's an open source code from the HAP Software Foundation. So what this pipeline essentially is trying to do is to take detector impact cloud points and progressively filter them to create track candidates that kind of form trajectories. So essentially think of them as raw data shown in blue points being translated progressively to essentially form the orange lines on the picture, you know, the candidate, the, the lines that you see. So this is really what people in say AI for science in the high energy physics domain at lots uh, um, at LTNL uh, and NERSCAR our uh, scientists are working on. From a lineage perspective, I think it's important to understand this pipeline is kind of unique in that it already uses four machine learning models in sequence organized uh, um, uh, pretty much as a cascade. So there are the usual challenges with scientific data like large data sets, large parameter size, uh, search space algorithms pretty much under development across multiple scientists multiple different execution environments. But from a lineage perspective, it becomes really hard to optimize uh, your neural networks uh, out of context using the available automation tools because one stage leads to the other. And as I mentioned before, for every one, say the embedding stage, the edge selection stage, and the graph neural network stage, you are uh, the minute you change a hyperparameter, you're essentially creating an experiment variant, right? So what combination of variants uh, to select is really the pipeline optimization optimization that needs to be done. So we've been able to use uh, CMF, which we'll describe going forward, to capture this uh, data lineage metrics, network architecture, hyperparameters across each variant of the pipeline stages um, with the Exatrack pipeline, essentially to provide this end-to-end -end visibility and reproducibility, and then to actually be able to provide uh, drive pipeline level optimization. The AI manufacturing quality control is another complex pipeline example where ML models may need to be retrained after deployment as the defects and imaging conditions may change over time. Only the most important data samples are selected for retraining to reduce the labeling effort, which adds to the complexity of the model provenance tracking. Recording of lineage and metadata is critical for pipeline reproducibility, audit trail, and also for the unwind of the model to previous conditions when needed. CMF enables this across the training and deployment domains, which can be the data center and the edge. And CMF also provides APIs to efficiently collect or track the data slices in cases when the subsets of the data sets are, uh, are selected in subsequent iterations. So it's a quick question. Is this tracking happen happening automatically or does the data scientist have control on what's being recorded? So if they go down a, a dead end, they can take that out of the... Yeah, the that's an... That's an excellent question, and you will see throughout the presentation a little bit more detailed, but a quick answer is both. There is a set of explicit APIs that the data scientists can use to track metadata, as well as the implicit capabilities that we are adding to uh, get the inputs and outputs automatically from the pipeline management tools. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I mean, um, so there is two parts that's kind of where the Git-like model really helps, because you, as you said, you know, you you might have recorded things explicitly, you put things in the code, but maybe as you're saying, there might be some experiments that you really don't want to preserve and push further. So you can choose which branch or what you really want to publish ultimately. So it's kind of like the Git push, and then you may have a master branch or you may have some of the branches that you want. And uh, one of the thinking is that then when you do the open lineage publish, you can probably choose which ones you actually publish forward. Um, Perfect, brilliant. You can, you can unbind, yeah, thanks. So going forward, so we have built CMF on the three pillars of reproducibility. Like you need to, for a reproduce an AI pipeline, you need the code, you need the metadata, and you need the exact data. So to track all of these, we have a metadata store, uh, which today is built on MLMD and ML flow. And uh, we have an artifact store today that backing is DVC, but it's actually a plug and play model and we can bring in any other artifact store. And for the tracking the uh, code versions, we have Git and Git is indexing that we keep. So on top of this, we have our logging engine, the APIs that we provide to actually log the 
um, the data set, the artifacts, and log the metadata that is needed. And we also have another query engine that allows you to mine information from what is recorded in CMF. So on top of it, we also have an optimization engine, which is like we are building it right now, which enables you to optimize these pipelines further, knowing that a certain set of metadata has worked well for a certain pipeline, for a certain data version. Well, how can we use that, that particular metadata to another pipeline or how we can um, how we can improve on the model training time or uh, derive a subset for your uh, active learning. So these are some of the optimizations that we are trying to build on top of the CMF right now. So going to the uh, how CMF compares with the other tracking tools. So there are uh, two different families of tracking tools, if I can say in the market. Some tools take a model-centric approach where they um, they provide um, APIs to track an ex particular experiment in detail. And some tools like MLMD provides a pipeline first approach where you can track the entire pipeline end to end. So CMF tries to bring in best of the both the worlds and tries to do both for you. So we have uh, taken abstractions. Uh, we have abstractions, abstractions that in, allow you to track and end-to-end -end pipeline. And we also have uh, APIs that allows you to track a particular experiment in detail. So one, th one um, highlight that we try to do is the Git-like support, uh, where you can share this metadata across. We don't want that metadata to be siloed and locked inside a particular data center. We want that ability to be able to share that metadata across like a Git-like fashion. You work on a particular experiment, you come to a logical conclusion, and now you have that metadata, you want to share it across. So the CMF enables that sharing of metadata between different teams that are working together. And we also have integrated versioning where every artifact that comes into CMF is automatically versioned, and it is identified by a unique hash. We also have APIs that allows subset identifications. So to understand like how a particular model evolves for a particular subset of a data, be it the gender, ethnicity, uh, et cetera. Um, also, we have uh, metrics to track the track your experiment. We, we have metrics to track a particular epoch or fine grain metrics. And also at the end of an experiment, more coarse grain metrics to track how a particular experiment has performed overall. Um, we also support lineage. So lineage is one uh, important factor in uh, LIM, uh, CMF where we track end-to-end -end lineage and we provide the lineage for the artifact and all the execution and also for the execution steps that uh, have been done in CMF. So, so uh, what this enables, finally, what this enables you is to get this end-to-end -end lineage from the different distributed sites across different experiment variants that you have done and across the different iterations of your model development. Like you have from the model engineering stage, lineage from the model engineering stage connected to the model inference stage. Again, if it goes through a retra retraining cycle, you will be able to ident identify which subset of data was used for retraining and how did that particular model evolve. So there, this could be a, multiple iterations to over this loop and we provide end-to-end -end lineage over all the different iterations that would have happened. So this helps in scenarios where you have a particular data set that is tainted and you want to remove that influence of that data, tainted data set, or you, or you want to know what is the influence, what are the other downstream artifacts that have got, that got polluted because of this tainted data set. All that information gets automatically extracted from these lineage that is provided. And the other important factor is the uh, collaboration that this enables between multiple team members. So we don't, uh, because we are able to uh, exchange this metadata between the teams, uh, we allow teams to learn from the metadata of each other and provide a much stronger um, model and ability to collaborate between different teams. So you can clone a particular repo, you can inspect the metadata that was already there, build on top of that metadata. And once you've done, and uh, with your experiment cycle, you can push that metadata to the Git repository um, and then pull it back and en enable that sharing. 
so on, metadata is never pushed to the git only the reference to that pointer is pushed to the git so git enables sharing for us so finally so what does it look like um, so we have a python library uh, so we have python apis by which you can track metadata so this is the um, explicit tracking of that metadata that is enabled using APIs. We have both explicit tracking and the implicit tracking. So this is an example of how it would look if you have to explicitly track your metadata. And these are the uh, metadata that gets tracked. You be track the Git repo, the Git, so that you have reproducibility, the version of the code that was used, the exact metadata that went into your, um, uh, your experiment. We track the version of the code using its content, version of the data with using its content hash. So we track each data set with its unique hash so that you can identify a data set anywhere in this distributed ecosystem and be able to stitch the lineage together. And so these are the metadata that we get collected. And finally, this is a simplified example of a lineage that gets um, built. So these yellow nodes are the data set nodes and these blue nodes are the processing steps that we take. And the uh, pink ones are the model that got developed and the green is the metrics. So this allows you that end-to-end -end visibility of how a data has evolved. What are the transformations that it went under? It, it took place. What are the uh, metadata? What are the hyperparameters used in each of these steps? And what is the final model that got built? And what is the final metrics for that model? So all this get automatically tracked and uh, that lineage is given to you. So, yeah, so we are, have just five minutes yeah so let us yeah maybe we yeah. can go yeah so this faster, maybe. so these are some of the abstractions that we enable to track this end-to-end -end lineage so this is the pipeline stage so the pipeline abstraction the context and the execution every execution is unique and uh, uh, for every execution there could be a, for a group of executions which has a same um, context, like a same stage in the pipeline. We group it under this context, and under the and there in a pipeline there could be multiple such contexts. So pipeline and the context is singleton for us. So it is identified by a unique name, and under the pipeline there could be a unique context uh, with a unique name, and there could be multiple such contexts. And different contexts, different executions are grouped under the context. So that allows us that, that unifying that pipeline name and the context stage under a pipeline allows us to stitch the lineage together. So these are some of the abstractions that we provide. Uh, I think I have discussed it before. So in the interest of time, I'm skipping these slides and over to um, Sergey. Yeah, I just want to spend a minute uh, very quickly on this slides and uh, talk a little bit about uh, implicit logging and integration of existing tools. Uh, essentially, um, the task for us is a piece of functionality on a, on a pipeline that's uh, parameterized by parameters. They take, uh, they take in, uh, named inputs and they produce named outputs. And, uh, and we, we, we define a set of rules that developers need to follow in order to develop these tasks. Uh, we provide a type system of artifacts that just references the external data, data sets, machine learning models, uh, objects representing the result of hyperparameter search. And then every artifact, artifact has an associated view right, which points to uh, who owns this artifact and where. Uh, that artifact is located within the base case of that owner. Uh, and then we provide uh, 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 function decorators in Python language to essentially turn into any any um, uh, function into, uh, into a task. And then that uh, gives uh, pretty much for free uh, two, two interesting features. One is automated logging. Um, and then another one is the ability to run these tasks on a common library interface. And the automated logging feature comes uh, no matter where you run this, either on a command line, in your uh, source code, or you package uh, this function, let's say, into a Docker, a singularity uh, image, and then run something else. And a couple words about uh, integration with third party tools. Um, and could you please uh, move to the next slide? Yeah, uh, so we want uh, CMF to be a uh, source and destination for 
uh, there is metadata flowing uh, around the AI pipeline. And we have uh, auto logging uh, feature that allows us to integrate with the existing ML and deep learning framework, such as MGVs and TensorFlow. And then we uh, integrate with ML tracking platforms uh, such as Pain, MLflow, and others through several methods. One of them is callback mechanism, another one is uh, something that Anne already mentioned, where we can replace existing ML and deep backend with, with MLflow if that makes sense for certain environments. And then, uh, as I just talked about, external references where we can just reuse uh, artifacts and manage by some other platforms of tools. So uh, going forward, so what we had, uh, so what we basically want to do is to have a open uh, ability to export our metadata in the open lineage format so that it can be consumed by other downstream catalogs or tools like markers. So this is what we had in mind, like uh, the abstractions are abstractions, these pipeline, pipeline context and executions are abstractions and how it maps towards the open lineage. So this is our very early understanding of how it could be mapped onto the open lineage, like a run in open, line, open lineage is kind of execution for us. And a job in the open lineage um, is a context for us. And you have already have abstractions for data set. And we also track metadata for data set. So we can have the data set facet uh, to be able to do that. And I am assuming the namespace uh, that uh, the, the, the namespace is the abstraction that ma maps to the pipeline for us. So these are the, uh, the translations as I had put it. Maybe there could be a better ways to do it or there it may not be, uh, we want a feedback on whether it's appropriate or not. And the other thing that is uh, what we do is track the model and the metrics. And I'm not sure there is a one-to-one -one translation for with or we have to wrap everything under a data set abstraction. So these are some of the questions we had. And also uh, we had a question on the run facet, like um, the, the facets that you have, whether we can independently push the facet or it should be always identified with a run. Um, those are some of the open questions we had in our mind on building this. Yeah, so I think this is pretty close. We can, so we, two minutes over time, but we can, I can go a little bit over to answer your questions. We can also follow up on the Slack channel. I think this is pretty close. So yes, execution maps to a run. I think from the pipeline perspective, I would think the pipeline maps to a job name. And if you look at the Marquez model, you see that the job gets version. So I think if from a, one pipeline to the next, the context changes. So I'm assuming in context, you have a hyperparameters changing or something, for example. Uh, then the job gets version, right? And, like, and so you have the context for the pipeline could be a job version in that sense. It's a stage. Uh, uh, so actually it's like a pipeline is a overall pipeline and then each stage of that is a context. So okay. maybe is it a parent job? Or maybe yeah, exactly, like exactly. So in that sense, that's a good uh, clarification. So yes, so in that sense, job are, can actually be hierarchical. So I think both the pipeline and the context would be jobs in that uh, sense. Um, and then the context would map to the pipeline as a parent job. So we kind of allow, they all map to jobs um, and there's a hierarchy involved. And I think on the data set point of view, yes, so your data set maps to a data set. And I think a model in that sense could map to a data set as well. Maybe we ought to be naming this data set thing as a, a little more generically. Um, and think in the open lineage model, the, the model, the um, machine learning model is an open lineage data set as well. It is the output of the training job. Uh, and then metrics for a model can be attached as a data set facet, right? Like, so it becomes, here is the metric, uh, like you may have measured, you know, accuracy of your model or whatever other metrics you have and attach it as a data set facet to your model. I would think yeah. roughly yeah. that would be how to map it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one question we had on the <clears throat> data set facet, because there are many static facets. I mean, maybe it's a very basic question that we have, but you it's not that every run event 
your facet data set, you know, schema and all characteristics that you extract are going to change. Um, so is it that we have a, uh, you know, can you, can you, how do you handle static facets, you know, maybe of, of data sets, which will have lots of characteristics, you know? Yeah, if you look at, um, so it, the, the, the way the model works is kind of observing what's the, the schema at this moment in time, right? Like, so in a lot of cases, people consume data sets, but they're not necessarily aware when the schema has changed, right? So the model captures, for example, what was the schema of your input at the time you read from it in case of someone change it. Uh, and in the output, uh, it's a bit similar, right? If you change the logic of your job and it changes the schema uh, of the output, you would capture it as well. So you have two uh, levels of data set facet. For example, if we talk about the output, you have the data set facet that I think that are more static, right? And it's we are kind of expecting that you publish what you output schema every time. Uh, what's your, and that's a data set facet, but you also have output facet and an output data set facet is specific to that particular run. So for example, if you put data quality metrics, like how many rows were generated by this transformation, like if we consider, for example, if people have data transformation because they're turning from their row, metadata, their row data set into some more model representation, they could capture how many rows they wrote in that particular run. And that can act as a data quality metric, right? Like if suddenly the number of rows changes or it's uh, vastly different, that can be an indicator that something wrong is happening. And that's more of an output facet in terms that it's making a statement about that particular run, right? That particular yeah. version of the data set as opposed to something that's more static that you put directly as a data set facet. So I understand if you know people are running out of time, yeah, uh, exactly. maybe we have to wrap it up, but we are happy. We can either follow up on the Slack channel or we can, you know, if there's need for more in-depth discussion, we could set up an ad hoc meeting if people yeah, are interested. And we would love to get some feedback, maybe maybe in the future such meeting, maybe feedback from the community also. You know. yeah. But I think it's super, super. Have you thought about bringing it into the LFAI and data? So, uh, so it's... Uh, you know, sort of much more visible. Yeah, As a project, you said it was yeah, open. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we would love to get feedback on, you know, should, you know, is that a good idea to to do that as well? And we've presented it to the LFAI Trusted AI community as well. Mm -hmm. um, got some got some feedback there. Uh, yeah, I think it'll help you get some more publicity because it looks super piece of work, really. In fact, one of the best... I've seen actually around really capturing AI in a way that is reusable. So I think you've done a super job. Yeah, that to me, like joining a, so joining a foundation, you have two reasons. So one is, you know, you become more visible, but the other one is also creating this really clear statement that this is for the community, by the community, right? There's the foundation behind it. It's not, uh, and you want to grow the community and bring other people as to be stakeholders in your project. Uh, and I think the LFAI is also good at creating this community between projects, you see, between Open Lineage and Nigeria and Marquez and Amundsen, and uh, there could be another one uh, to join this group. Okay. Very helpful. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all for presenting. Yeah. I think there was a question uh, uh, learning about open lineage and its adoption. So we don't really have time right now. Do, do you want to follow up on the Slack channel or do we want to, we can talk about it next time or that's from uh, Amri. Oh, I think sure. you may have it. Oh, you're here, right. Did you want to, do you want to, maybe we'll follow up on Slack if that yeah. makes sense. Yes. Sounds good. Let's do that then. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, or evening, depending on the time zone. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, see you next time. And uh, looking forward to hear more about your project. And feel free to follow up on the, the Slack channel in between the meetings. Bye bye. Thank you, Julian. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Later.